Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, and we are excited every week to bring you stories from around the world, people who are finding cool ways to, to make the universe a better place. Uh, the idea is that we, we appeal to people's sense of service. As Rotarians, we're into that, service above self. And our club has a special interest in innovation, entrepreneurship, and education. And uh, to that end, we look for every, every kind of interesting speaker we can find who will share uh, an inspiring message. Our speaker today, uh, Dr. Christian Busch, uh, is going to tell us a little bit about serendipity and, and research he has done. He's a member of the faculty at New York University. Uh, he's a visiting faculty member of the London School of Economics and an all-around good guy, and so we are happy to have you here. Christian, I hand it over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Russian, for the uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. Um, talking about something that is very close to my heart uh, for the last 15 years. And uh, it's really something where, um, you know, when looking back over the last 15 years of both building communities, building companies, but also now in my research, um, it is that kind of thing that seemed to happen to the most successful people, the most successful companies, much more often than others. They, some people just seem to get much luckier than others, and some companies seem to have much more of these kind of unexpected positive outcomes than other companies. And so. Um, what I've become very curious about is what is that pattern behind that? So how can we set ourselves for the unexpected and enable ourselves to, to turn the unexpected into something positive? So what I'd love to do is, being the German I am, I have, a, a, of course, a, a kind of agenda. Um, so I'll, talk with, uh, I'll start with the context um, uh, and, and then directly go into the art and science of serendipity. Um, what is it and what is it not? And, and why is it different from what we might assume it is? And then really, how do we cultivate that serendipity? How do we set ourselves up for the unexpected? Because the, like, obviously one thing we realize at the moment is that throughout history, and especially the moment we are in at the moment, civilization has depended on our ability to cope with the unknown, to cope with the unexpected. And, you know, usually that happens in our individual lives. I don't know when we run into someone in the coffee shop who becomes our co-founder, or we meet someone in a library who becomes our life partner, right? So it's kind of, it's these monumental events, but they're usually very individual. But then a lot of times, actually, we might have collective unexpected things happening where then a couple of people make something unexpected out of it. So, for example, at the moment here in New York, where I am, uh, you will see that breweries will use their alcohol uh, to make hand sanitizer. Or you will see other people who are connecting the dots because they see there is a big problem here that's unexpected. But let's use now what we have to, to somehow turn it into as positive as it can be, um, even in a dire situation. But what's important, of course, is in times like this of uncertainty, but also in general, when you look at what makes people more successful, joyful, and you know, purpose-driven than, than others, is really kind of developing this muzzle for the unexpected. I want to give you a couple of examples. Um, I don't know if any of you can guess what this thing on the left is. It's a good sign. It's a good sign that you can't spoil it because, so essentially, a couple of decades ago, um, a couple of researchers were injecting um, um, a, a kind of medication uh, against angina into participants, and they saw some kind of movements in the trousers of male participants. And so, you know, um, they were surprised. It was unexpected, right? And what would we usually do? We would either ignore it, right? Because it's like embarrassing to see that, that, that these men had an erection, or we would say, oh my God, let's find a quote unquote better solution to essentially cure angina. They did exactly the opposite. They said, okay, this is unexpected, but you know what? We know that a lot of men have this problem, so why don't we try to develop this as a medication in itself? And this is how Viagra evolved, right? Viagra was completely serendipitous, but they worked through it by connecting the dots. On the right, any guesses what the thing on the right is? So this is a potato washing machine. And so essentially um, what, what, what happened was a hire, a company in China, uh, they produce washing machines and refrigerators. And a couple of years ago, they got calls from farmers. And the farmers called them up and said, well, I'm trying to wash my potatoes in the washing machine, but it always breaks down. And so what would we usually do now is, we would of course tell them, we would try to quote unquote, educate the customer and tell them, well, don't wash your potatoes in a washing machine. This is a washing machine for clothes. What they did was the opposite. They said, okay, you know what? There's a lot of farmers in China. So why don't we build in a better dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? Now there you got the potato washing machine. Um, a lot of other things um, we don't have time for, but in general, you have kind of um, TEDx Volcano, all these kind of interesting, innovative things that are coming up when you really try to trace back how they came about. A lot of times it was something unexpected, 
where then essentially a certain trigger happens, right? A certain kind of incidents like a bulge in the trouser of a male participant or a farmer calling you up and telling you that they wash their potatoes in the washing machine. It's unexpected, right? But now it's what we do with it. We have to connect the dots. We have to link that to something else that actually solves a problem or that actually does something. Or if I run in the coffee shop into someone who could be my partner, it's not enough to just run into them, right? I got to work for it. I got to do something with it. And I have to have the tenacity to follow through with. And that is really the difference from what we assume a lot of times serendipity is, right? Just something that happens to us as something lucky. But actually, it's a process once we distill it. And it's the process of spotting and connecting the dots. And then those people who do that all the time, they seem to much, be much luckier than others, but actually they had to work hard for it. And so serendipity really has this unexpected good luck that comes from proactive decisions that lead us to, to positive outcomes. And obviously most people miss it all the time, right? They might not see the trigger, they might not connect the dots, and they might not have the tenacity to go through with it. So history is full of examples where people started out in the exactly same situation. So for example, in the example of papain, which is an enzyme, um, they were injecting that into rabbits and uh, they, the rabbits had floppy ears and um, two researchers injected that at the same time. One of them actually reacted to it and was like, oh my God, this is interesting. The other one didn't follow up. The one track of research led to a Nobel Prize for someone else um, setting that up and, and you know, curing arthritis and everything else. The other thing didn't like end anywhere, right? The point is we, when we look at counterfactuals, so what could have happened and at people who had the same starting condition and similar things that they saw as unexpected, we can actually map serendipity and serendipity missed versus serendipity gained. The same, of course, we can do when we compare people, right? Um, um, so there's a lot of uh, work on luck uh, where um, there's experiments, for example, how people identify um, the unexpected. So for example, a, um, Richard Weisman in the UK, what he did was a couple of experiments um, where he took people who self-identified as very lucky and people who self-identified as extremely unlucky. And then he said, okay, um, he took the very lucky person and said, okay, walk down the street, go into the coffee shop, order the coffee and sit down. That's it, nothing more. And the unlucky person do the same. What they didn't tell them is, okay, there's a five pound note in front of the entrance and there's only four tables in the coffee shop. And on the table closest to the corner where they're supposed to sit is this super successful businessman who can make very big dreams happen. And so now the lucky person walks down the street sees the five pound note, picks it up, goes inside the shop, orders a coffee, has a nice conversation with a barista, sits next to the businessman, because that's the, count, like the, the table next to the counter, has a great conversation, makes a friend, and we don't know if an opportunity comes out of it, but it wouldn't be unexpected, right? The unlucky person walks down the street, steps over the five pound note, goes inside the shop, also sits next to the businessman, because that's the person who is closest to the corner, ignores the businessman, and that's it. Now, at the end of the day, they ask both people, so how was your day today? And so the lucky person says, well, it was amazing. I found money in the street. I made two new friends. And we don't know if there's an opportunity coming out of it, but might well be, right? Um, the unlucky person just says, well, nothing really happened. And you might see this in your own lives, right? That like some people just, you know, in couples, for example, who meet exactly the same people or have exactly the same things happening, but one of them seems to be a bit luckier than others. And so what I've been fascinated by is the question, what is it about it? What are these questions? Like what makes some people have more of this than others in general? To, to kind of lead us to this smart life. So one of course is to overcome our biases. We constantly underestimate how, how probable the unexpected is. It is very probable actually, you know, between me like throwing coffee over my thing, uh, Rushton, Rushton's lamp falling on his head, Manu chairs like brother running into the room and like pushing him away, whatever it is, there's all these potential things that are in itself extremely unlikely. But actually, when you add them up, it becomes extremely likely that one of these things at some point might happen, right? And so the interesting thing is we constantly underestimate how probable the unexpected actually is. And then we post-rationalize. So we, we make up a purpose for it, right? So uh, take the example of the CV. Uh, if you have a new job interview or something uh, and you go to, to the employer, you will probably say, yeah, no, I, I started out here in this industry because I wanted to learn more about this so that I could get here, right? So what you're doing is you're telling a linear story step by step by step. But actually, life plays out as a, as a squibble, right? And so in a way, we try to usually make a plan, and then the unexpected happens, but we still tell it as if it fit into the plan, or we just pretend we always had that plan. And so obviously, in companies, that's a problem, because we can't really learn from each other. Because if you talk about a marketing strategy, where afterwards, you just kind of post-rationalize everything that you just went through, we can't really learn about what really happened. And so there's a lot of interesting strategies how we can avoid these kind of things. 
One, for example, is the project funeral, where essentially, um, you know, in, in companies, um, they do a post-mortem type thing where when an idea doesn't work out. So, for example, at one of the companies I've been uh, coordinating with, um, they had a picture, a window frame, right? So like a, a glass window. And the idea was um, to not have the light reflect. So it's a great technology, but they didn't realize nobody's going to pay a lot of money for this. And so the idea was now to go on stage, the project manager, in front of project managers from other disciplines or from other departments and just talk about what they learned from the failure. So it's not about celebrating failure, but it's about celebrating the learning from the failure. And so what he did was to say, look, we underestimated there's no market for it, but the technology seems to be nice. Someone in the audience is like, hey, 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 have you considered what this would mean for solar? Uh, because the, the, the energy that this can absorb is so huge that this could be amazing. And so this is how part of the solar division emerged. Completely unexpectedly, um, they would now talk about it was luck that this person was in the audience. Yeah, but you know what? You do that 10 times, like these kind of practices, and you will, it, it will be very probable that something unexpected will happen. And so the point is, we can introduce these kind of practices that, that build in a certain common trust, that build in a certain kind of idea that we open ourselves up for dots to be connected, right? Other people now can connect the dots for us because we let them know what they could connect them to. Now, there's a couple of other practices, and for the sake of time, so Rashid and I had a very tough uh, uh, negotiation about how much time uh, I, could, I could take for the, for the presentation. So I will, I will try to keep this very short. If you're interested um, in the Q&A, we can go much deeper. Um, but for now, I just want to briefly touch on a couple of these practices that everyone can use in their own lives and their own companies. One is asking questions differently. That's my favorite because it's so simple, right? Um, so, you know, you know, this dreaded, what do you do question at the conference or, um, you know, at a virtual conference now. And the, the slight change in terms of not asking that, but asking what's on your mind, what inspired you the most or whatever it is, already puts people not into a box. But more importantly, when someone asks us, what do you do? Um, there's the hook strategy. So the hook strategy is essentially to say, if you ask me, what do you do? Or if you ask Oli Barrett, who's an amazing entrepreneur in London, what he does, he would say, well, I'm in education, but I've recently been exploring philosophy and I just started playing the piano. So he uses the same space of answer, but he sets three hooks. Three times now, it could be, oh my God, such a coincidence, I just started playing the piano. Oh my God, such a coincidence, I started with philosophy. Oh my God, such a coincidence, X, Y, Z. What we're doing here is we're seeding a couple of potential dots that the other person can connect based on what they are most interested in. And so essentially, we open up the box of, of potential serendipity to happen. There's also a couple of other things that I talked about, looking at mistakes differently and crises. There's reframing. Um, you know, things like, uh, so for example, Wakas, who's a wonderful entrepreneur um, uh, in construction, and he posted an update on LinkedIn. And that's obviously particularly relevant at the moment where he would just post an update. And then this Chinese young gentleman reached out to him and he was like, well, this was really inspiring. Can I work for you? And you know, Wakas, like he doesn't have the resources to like employ another person. So he, usually what would we do? We would either say, I'm sorry, I don't have a job for you or let's ignore the message and that's it, right? Wakas did the opposite. He's, he briefly looked at the profile and he saw this guy is based in China or has like roots in China. And he's like, you know what? He wrote him, I always wanted to expand to China. If you have any ideas, send them my way. If not, hey, it was great to meet you. This kid writes back, well, my father is one of the largest construction developers in, in, in China. And, you know, maybe we can make something happen. And that's how one of Wakas' biggest projects emerged. Now, it seems lucky, right, that he met the son off. But you know what? He worked for it. Right. And so, again, he allowed other people to connect the dots for him and enable that kind of serendipity to happen. There's also a lot of practices within companies we can do everything from serendipity spotting. So, for example, when we have meetings to ask people for what was something surprising last week that that surprised them. And then what happens is a lot of times, you know, we might have had a marketing strategy, but by allowing that strategy to have surprising elements, we might adjust, right? We might realize it's not about selling more washing machines, but it's about surprisingly selling potato washing machines, right? If we don't ask that question, we will never get into that idea that there could be serendipity. This is my reminder that I got to wrap up. Um, and so then, of course, we have um, uh, leveraging technology and space design. So really thinking about virtual places and offline places in terms of how do we get people to run into each other, especially that they're uh, different. And then, of course, the most important one is always easier to connect the dots if we know what, them, what to connect them to. Right. So if we have a sense of like a certain North Star we have, a certain curiosity, take the example of Paul Pullman, the ex-CEO of Unilever. When he was still the CEO of Unilever, people always thought he was very unfocused because he would take on very unexpected projects. And then they wouldn't always necessarily fit exactly into what you would assume Unilever does. 
but actually he was very intentional. He always said, my underlying common denominator is, I wanna help other people help themselves. If you come with a project that gives me a little bit of this and relates it to the capability of Unilever, I will be on your side. And so he had a North Star that made him focus, but not over-focused. And that's one of the key secrets, obviously, this idea of we need a sense of direction to connect the dots, but we can't over-define um, that so that we get limited. And so wrapping up, um, this really leads to what I think is the key thought behind all of this, that it's in the spirit of Viktor Frankl um, that, that this idea with serendipity is, yes, a lot of times we cannot plan the unexpected. We can create more of the unexpected positively, but we cannot, you know, like something like COVID or something happens and, and we have to cope with it. And then the idea is that between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in this space, there's our power to, to choose. And this kind of like will be our growth and our freedom. And this essentially is how serendipity happens, right? That we look at a certain situation in a certain way and then connect the dots. And so with this, uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, for joining. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Perfect, Christiane. Thank you so much. Uh, and if you would go ahead and stop sharing the screen, we'll introduce everybody who is on the call. Oh, by the way, this is, yeah, anyways. Uh, my editor tells me to mention that there's a book coming out, which is here. You see that? I'm always forgetting it, but you know, it's, it's coming out soon. So here it is. Um, Nick, yeah, wonderful. Can make a, oh, sorry. Can you make a screenshot of slide 15 before you unshare? Is that possible? Oh, slide 15? Yes, slide thank 15. you. <laughs> How do you, uh, is there like all, a... Oh, no, the, the one with all the, the six bubbles of the things oh, to okay. check out and do. Uh, yep. Thank you so much. I'm just going to take a quick screen grab. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Good, good, good. So uh, I want everybody to, to wave when I, when I call your name. Uh, I'll, I'll go in the order that I see folks. Uh, I'm, my name, <laughs> see myself, I'm Rushton. Nice, nice to meet you. Um, our member, Farheen, who is here in, uh, in Santa Clara. Uh, Manu and uh, Nadia, both in Germany, I believe. All right. And then we've got Kemi. Uh, Kemi, remind me where you are. East Coast, I believe, New York, is that right? I'm, no, I'm actually uh, at the area. I'm in Mill Valley. And that would be Mill Valley. Excellent. All right, good, good. <laughs> We've got Shags, our paella master, who is up in Walnut Creek here in California. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have uh, Susan, who is in Oregon. We have Cecilia, who is here in, uh, in San Jose. Uh, we have uh, Nazila, not on camera at the moment, who is in London. Good to have you with us as well. And so very exciting stuff. Uh, and I'm sure that we've got plenty of questions. Wave at me if you've got a question ready to go. And we will start with you. And if you're not waving at me, we'll start with me. And my first question is TEDx Volcano. What, where was that going? I, t talk to me about TEDx Volcano. Yeah. Well, it's, it's one of my favorites, actually, because so it, it was actually, so Manu and I were part of a community called Sandbox, and, and a Sandboxer at that time, um, uh, who I didn't know yet, but we had a mutual friend, and he called me up on a Saturday, and that was during the time when, you know, this volcano with the unpronounceable name in Iceland, in Iceland, like, broke out at the Kirkul or something. An Icelandic friend of mine said, like, Christian, you're stupid to try to pronounce it, just say E and then 14, right? It's 14 letters, whatever these letters are, it's just a lot of letters. Um, and so essentially, um, that volcano just broke out and all flights in London were grounded, right? And at that point was the Skull World Forum, so the biggest social entrepreneurship forum in the world. And all these amazing people were, were, were essentially stuck in London and nobody knew how long it would take. Uh, some of them took the boat, but like most of them stayed in London. And so um, essentially then, um, like Nathaniel called me up on a Saturday morning. He was like, Christian, all these amazing people are stuck in London. Uh, I want to organize a conference. Within 30 hours, he organized TEDx Volcano, full-fledged conference, 10,000 people on the recorded live stream, Jeff Skoll and others speaking, with essentially no resources, but just pulling people in who he kind of just randomly connected with. And what I found fascinating about this is that Lasagna, like, he essentially, everyone had the same serendipity trigger, right? Everyone had a volcano breakout, but Nathaniel connected the dots and he saw, okay, Ted loves stories like this. They will come on board if I come with something like turning uncertainty into opportunity or something. So he called up or he wrote Ted an email and said, hey, look, can I do this? They gave him the brand and he pulled in others based on the brand and so on, right? So it became this whole kind of like um, ripple effect, but it all started with Nathaniel connecting the dots and seeing something that others didn't see in the moment. Um, and so I've always found that fascinating as like an example of, how the most random of things, right? You can always like turn that into, into, into like a serendipitous outcome. And again, it gave him, it gave us a great event, but it also gave him a lot of visibility. So for him, it was great also as, as, a, as a thing that happened. 
Uh, you're muted, Russell. No. Perfect, thanks. And Manu, I know you have a question, so let's bring you on for yours. Yeah, that's true. Well, first, uh, thanks, Christian, uh, uh, for sharing that. It was very insightful and also gave some uh, challenges, uh, I assume, uh, to all of us. It, to me, it reminded me of the, one of my favorite uh, Sören uh, Kierkegaard's uh, quotes, uh, I think, uh, uh, who said, life uh, can only be lived uh, 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 no, it can only be understood backwards, but it, it has to be lived uh, uh, forwards. Uh, and, and that, that was a, a huge reminder to me of that. Um, I have actually two uh, small questions. The first would be, uh, you talked about Sandbox uh, uh, just recently and, and we're in a Rotary meeting. Uh, what is the role that you see for um, networks uh, uh, like this? Um, uh, uh, what impact do they have on our chances uh, to, to, to and how can we use them uh, 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 to have impact? And the second question uh, might, might come uh, as a, a bit more uh, weird, but I think it makes sense. Uh, I recently uh, uh, read the CARE Manifesto by uh, Jennifer Nedelsky, Canadian philosopher who works a lot on, on the role of care in our society and economy. And she uh, uh, has this nice, uh, uh, sum up of all her work saying that uh, if we really want to change uh, economy and value care, uh, the first question we should ask people at conferences and wherever should not be uh, uh, what's your job, uh, but we should change that to who do you care for? And uh, uh, I, for me, that's a beautiful question. And, uh, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts if that might be a helpful way of uh, uh, getting into more uh, of uh, serendipity. Yeah, uh, th these are um, uh, yeah fantastic questions. And, and by the way, thank you so much, Manu, for making the connection between us, right? I mean, uh, Rashid and I obviously met because, because of you. We serendipitously probably met at some point. And you you, you, you the did the work, right? Uh, I just introduced, yeah. <laughs> Exactly, but but so um, but no, but but you obviously have the magic kind of you know you always uh, make interesting connections. So that's the serendipity at heart. Um, but but essentially, um, so it's interesting. So maybe um, uh, starting with the first one, um, um, or maybe starting with the second one, because I have so such such, such short-term memory that I hopefully get away with then remembering the first one once I get to the the first one again. But like the the second one um, was was really um, interesting because. One thing I've been struggling with quite a bit is almost how do you ask exactly those kind of questions without making it a bit too over the top, right? So if I, if I would go to a conference and, and say something like, what is your passion or who do you like, who are you passionate about or, you know, like these kind of questions, um, obviously it might overwhelm some people, right? Because it might just be like, oh, okay, what, what are you trying to tell me here? Or what is your kind of, you know, who do you think you like that kind of like a bit like too much type in your face versus if it's if you're subtly asked the same thing but in another way right so if it's again like that's why i like these kind of things like hook strategies and so because you you get the same result that someone leads you towards where they're excited about but you don't necessarily push it on them because most people like i have that with myself right like 10 15 years before the sandbox times if someone would ask me what are you really passionate about there would be an awkward silence in the sense of i would be overwhelmed by it right now it's easy now i'm walking around like yeah i'm passionate about connecting the dots but Kierkegaard wise, right? I had to connect them at hindsight to understand that this is what I, what I really enjoy. So my point is that I think there's this kind of like delicate balance, I think, between having inspirational questions that allow people to, to, to really find their way through those questions and kind of pushing something on them where it's almost a filter. And I've used that, admittedly, I've used those kind of questions sometimes when I feel I'm at an event and I don't have a lot of time. I use those kind of questions as a filter, right? Because it directly gives me an idea of, is that someone interesting I want to speak with or not? But then I realized, you know what? A lot of times I miss out on the really interesting introverts because they might not like have a, an answer on it. But if I talk with them for half an hour, they warm up to it, right? And so I feel like I've developed a deep appreciation of, of, of trying to find that balance between inspirational and not overwhelming. And, and I feel to your point, right? It's, it's, it's almost like in research, you know, you have, you have something that you measure um, that you can ask people, but actually then it's, there's the concept and in a way almost sometimes it's, it's quite different from, from each other. And so to your point, maybe there's indirect things, um, but I think it's a great question in itself. Like the question, who do you care about? I, I love that. That's the kind of question I would ask at a sandbox dinner or something, right? I would be like, literally tell me who you care about. So like, it's, it's exactly, I think that those kind of questions. Um, and then the, the first question around how communities like Sandbox um, uh, kind of, you know. And Rotary, of course. Uh. And Rotary uh, play a role. I mean, 
one thing, and that might be a bit like more a spiritual answer, um, um, but, but I, I feel one of the core ideas of why communities exist is because humans have a longing for being part of something, right? And, 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 and those people who are not part of something, they very quickly lose identity or they very quickly don't have a feeling of, you know, there's a deep like, sense of isolation. And I think most people in the world tend to have a deep sense of isolation uh, in, in general, because that's like, it's almost like the existentialism type thing that like we're all trying to figure it out, right? But those kind of communities, by being more relational, can get us away from the transactional that makes us feel even more isolated, right? And I see that especially, I think, I think the, the, the higher up you are in terms of the, the type of people in traditional hierarchies, the more if people like meet each other, they, they meet based on positions or certain ideas of who they are, right? And so it becomes very transactional and it becomes like an idea of who has what, and so, of course, that makes people close down, right? And, and versus if, and, and Manu, you've been really good at this as well, I think. Um, one of the key ideas behind Sandbox, obviously, was to say, leave your position at the door for now. Of course, it will come up at some point. But if you meet differently, when you come inside, you first meet over common denominators, like what is challenge at the moment? Yes, we all go through transitions or we all go through transformations, whatever it is. And when we connect based on this, that's where the really big stuff happens. And that's the core belief why I think at the moment those communities are so valuable because these communities were not built to fix a problem. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of communities that were built to fix a particular problem, right? So like if you have a XYZ SDG group, they are there to fix malnutrition or, or at least think they, they might be able to fix it. But the, 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 the beauty of like Rotary or Sandbox is you have people there who have built relationships over so many years that if there is something they could get into action, you already have so much buy-in, you have so much goodwill, but a lot of times it's about channeling this. And I think we haven't been really good at channeling this. We haven't been really good at saying there are pre-existing communities who have so much social capital, who have so much goodwill, who have so much they could do, but actually rallying the troops based on their trust. I think almost no community has done really well. And I think obviously the bigger communities are, the more like the tougher it is. And I think that's what I like about the structure of Rotary, Sandbox and others. I think the more you can localize these kind of things, but within a global platform, the more you can then try to leverage those and, and almost like try to get the best of both worlds. And so, um, Manu, I think this is one of these questions where I could answer in 20 different ways. I randomly chose one way to answer it, um, but I think there's, there's obviously so many different um, uh, ways to answer it. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But, uh, yeah, but, but long story short, really this idea of, I think there's such a huge untapped thing that's there and that could be, unleashed, but there's not many people who have the inspirational capacity to unleash that. So we'll have one more question uh, and then we'll wind things down for the recording and then we'll keep talking to you because that's the cool piece of being part of the recording. So I'll hand it over to one of our guests, it's Nadia for the last question. Thank you. Um, so if I understood correctly, right, you study serendipity and understanding the underlying patterns, right? So I was curious how much you look into personal development um, and personal belief systems. Because when you gave, for example, the example from the coffee shop, what I personally heard was just like, how much trust do I have in life and in myself and how open am I towards others in the same way that other people will subconsciously or consciously feel more comfortable also looking at me if I'm sitting next to them. <laughs> And because um, that's what I heard, it made me think like um, years back, I once did a internship in um, cognitive behavioral therapy in a clinic for patients who had like psychosomatic issues, a lot of anxiety and depression, which for me was the biggest takeaway as well, because you hear so much about like, you know, wishes to the universe and like the spiritual sense of think of what you want, you'll get it. And then I was like, well, actually in cognitive behavioral therapy, it's what you focus on is actually what you're going to be, what you will be seeing. So it's actually, you can say it spiritually, you could actually see it very psychologically and academically. How much does that play into your research? It's a wonderful question because that's, so one of the joys actually of writing that book was exactly this, that like realizing how every science is saying the same thing. Like, it's almost like, like when you look at what Buddhism is saying in terms of we are one or, what what um, you know physics quantum mechanics is saying in terms of energy or you know or concretely if you think about something like entropy right how energy travels very similar to how spiritually we think about there might be a god energy out there um, you, you know there's 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 there, it's almost like in every 
when it comes to serendipity, there's so many different natural and social sciences. And in a way, everyone's saying the same thing, which is if you set yourself up for it, it will happen. And so it's just then the focus of, is it an energetic focus, right? Which is like practices like meditation and anchoring, which can be super effective because it also understand, like it makes us understand better our North Star, but also it makes us obviously being more driven out of vision rather than fear and really kind of being like connecting the dots in ways that actually really make us better rather than kind of just kind of getting away from something, which, which is really a big shift. Um, but also then, you know, in, in different sciences that, that say the same thing in molecular um, chemistry, for example, they can show how you can accelerate um, unexpected reactions of molecules and then have a lot of kind of positive unexpected reactions where that's how they churn out all these serendipitous discoveries. They just accelerate the process of unexpectedness. Um, but that's the same in, in entropy, right, where things have to be in motion. Um, long story short, like I feel that the beauty of, of serendipity is that it's all about these kind of questions of how do two things connect, right? And how do you, how do you, how do you create in a way the momentum in some way that allows to do that? And one way of, of the momentum, of course, is the way how we frame it, right? If we don't believe that these dots can connect or if we don't believe that we can influence how these dots connect, it will most probably not happen. As someone who has for a very long time struggled with overcoming imposter syndrome, like I can tell you, like once I, you know, like, finally got a bit more into, okay, I deserve this a bit more than I think I deserve it, whatever it is, like serendipity, like tripled, right? Because now I'm like, I deserve this opportunity. I deserve this opportunity. I deserve this. I think this is possible. And you know, like, that's what I found fascinating in some of the research for the book. Also, I talked with this amazing guy in a, um, in a, um, in a, uh, like who's, who's, who's working in London. And he essentially said before he was 25, he never had serendipity afterwards all the time. And it was actually, he went through a similar CBT type framing process where essentially like it helped him to say, okay, how do I feel deserving and worthy of, of opportunities, right? And I feel like to me, this is one of the biggest things. A lot of my work is in very low income contexts and we have messed it up so long, like as kind of benevolent clubs and others where we've developed this mindset, right? Hey, here's a resource. And if you have that kind of mindset, what happens is you put people into the role of the beneficiary, which essentially means I'm a victim, right? And I think that's kind of like the first thing I will never forget that when I went to Kenya and, 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 and South Africa, um, a really good friend of mine now who, who built an amazing organization there that does low cost education, I asked him, so what is the one thing I should never ask you as a white guy coming into your context and thinking I have, have it all figured out? And he was like, never ask me, what do I need first? Like, don't ask me, what do I need? Because if that is your first question, you frame me as the person who's dependent on you, or you frame me as some, someone who needs something from you. Whereas if you come in and say, great, so what can we work with? What's here already? Fantastic, let's do this together. We can elevate what you're having already here. Now we're reframing this from, I have to create your luck to you can create your own luck and I will be part of doing this with you. And I think that kind of reframing incredible, especially in development contexts, but to your point on the individual level, it applies to everywhere, right? That once we allow that idea that I can create my own luck, I start creating it. If I don't give that like framing, then it doesn't happen, right? And then it's fascinating to see these kind of concepts. Thank you so much for the great question. I would also love to, I, mean, I know that Russian is rushing to uh, close the, the chat, but um, the, <laughs> the, but the, sorry for the wordplay, it's the bad German humor, but, but the, uh, the <laughs> But the, but the, um, I think in German we call it anti-jokes, right, Manu or, or Nadia? I think that's the kind of, uh, anyways, but, but the point being, um, yeah, I'd love to hear also what you think, because it thinks like you really thought through this. And also same too, you know, I'd love to learn more from you. I'm a big believer that most of the knowledge usually is in the room and not in the presenter. So I'd love to also learn from you. But, but for we, now, thank you so much. We will, we will definitely continue that thought as we seek the unifying uh, theory of everything in the post-recording piece uh, of this. For all of our, our guests uh, and members, make sure you let us know you were here. There is an attendance, please. Uh, there is a space in that for you to put your email address. If you are a visiting Rotarian and you properly type in your email address, you'll get an email that you can pass along to your club secretary to make a miss. A good thing for sure. Uh, a little farther down the page, you'll see our discussion session. Let us know what you thought of the meeting, of the program. And with that, I will hand it back over to Christiane for the final comment, final word. Uh, and I am excited to hear how you're going to sum up many of the things that you've been telling us over the last half hour. Well, it's a great question because it brings me back to uh, the city where I'm from, Heidelberg, and we have a philosopher's way. And Goethe used to write some of his poems there. And, and he, he inspired Viktor Frankl, the, the psychotherapist who, who, who survived the Holocaust. Um, and 
what they both kind of had in common was this idea that if you take someone as they are, you make them worse. But if you take someone as who they could be, you make them capable of becoming who they can be. And so this idea of potentiality, the idea of if I see more in a situation than there is at the moment, I enable others to see that. But also I myself then can really thrive more and unbox myself and so on. And I feel like our role as leaders and our role as communities or community builders is to enable people to become their best self rather than assuming there is a former drug dealer and they will always be a drug dealer. No, there's a former drug dealer, but they are a potential teacher. And so it's kind of really that potentiality that I think underlies uh, most of that work. Excellent. And we'll see you next week.